Hello, and welcome to Nemo's webinar, The Art of Networking. My name is Elizabeth, and I work for Nemo. As the Network for Museums in Europe, our main activities are advocating for museums on an EU level, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to engage and learn from one another, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. Nemo has increased its online activity with webinars such as this one, with the hope that participants can continue their professional development even during these uncertain times. We are looking forward to today's webinar, facilitated by Anna Steinkamp, an independent consultant in international cultural cooperation and project management. She specializes on strategies for cultural networks and offers strategic consultancy to actors in the field of international cooperation. This webinar will explore why museums gather in networks and what their impact is. At the end of the webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions during a Q&A round using the chat function. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Anna to get started. Thank you, Liz, and hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar The Art of Networking, also from my side. So as Liz already pointed out, my name is Anna Steinkamp, and I'm going to share some of my insights and experiences when it comes to networks in the culture field. And thanks uh, for the invitation to Nemo, and uh, thanks for having me. So um, just a sh short notice also why I am talking to you about networking. Um, I'm working as a consultant for cultural cooperation, networks, and strategic processes. And uh, furthermore, I have uh, over 10 years of experience in UNESCO context. I worked for the German Commission for UNESCO, where I co-founded a global network of young experts uh, in the field of cultural diversity. And uh, as a consultant, I'm used to setting up, facilitating, advising diverse cultural networks. And last but not least, I also did some research on network governance of international networks. And just to be clear, I am not a museum expert. So as time is precious, um, so let me tell you what you can expect in the next 45 minutes, no, 55 minutes, actually. Um, I will introduce some insights into the phenomenon of networking, including what I mean when I say network. We will then see how this phenomenon develops also in the museum sector. And I will also give some examples here. And this will then lead me to, to cluster some benefits and challenges of networking or even of working in, in the form of networks. And at the end, uh, I will um, provide some hints in case you're interested in coordinating networks. And as Liz already said, we will have at least 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for you to ask questions, to comment. And I already invite you now to take notes of the, uh, meanwhile, when I'm talking, to take notes of your question and then share them when I end in the public chat. So let's get started. So what I am talking about when I say network is the image I show here can be applied to many, many disciplines, uh, such as the IT sector, biology or sociology. And it is about points and, and lines that are linked to each other. This is uh, as simple as that. This is a network. But today we look at the organizational and sociological side of, of this image. We talk about people linked to each other about people or a group of people interacting beyond institutional, geographical, or other borders. People who organize to achieve a common goal can be generally speaking called a network. As such, networks are not a new phenomenon, but are the core of societal constitution. So you can also call your family or your, your network of friends, you can call it, or your friends you can call, you can see this image I just seen in, in, in your private field also. You might also know some historic examples of networks as for example, the Hangartic League in Northern Germany or also the craft network of guilds in medieval times. And also the cre creation of Diderot's encyclopedia is a joint creation of a network of writers and intellectuals. However, the notion or better said what it stands for appears more adequate nowadays than ever. It also, I always refers to that network is also a buzzword. Through the possibilities of digital media, the high degree of mobility of people, goods and services, and thus overcoming geographical time and national boundaries, 
Social networks are considered to be one of the most appropriate organizational forms in the 21st century because they are flexible, adaptable, often non-hierarchical, and have an open character compared to, for, for example, like traditional institutions. At the same time, in a world of disorder and uncertainty, as we are experienced right now, they offer the opportunity to combine efforts, quickly connect people and knowledge and provide orientation. However, they often struggle to sustain continuity. And networks do work as long as they share the same communication codes as, for example, a common goal, a common cause, or even a common value. And here we can also see and say that the currency of networks, sorry for the economic term, uh, is information and knowledge that often translates, when we look at the practice, it translates into best practice compilation, into short uh, calls to colleagues to ask, okay, what do you think about it? Do you have an idea about whatsoever? In newsletters, in conference, or even in policy making tools. Having said that we are talking about social networks, so a network of people, let me add another aspect. More specifically, I am talking today of networks as an organizational form that might take many different forms, such as informal working groups or even an informal bunch of like-minded like people, a forum, associations, federations or alliances. And you might all know these kind of formal and non-formal networks. And just to be clear, when I say networking today, I do not refer to coffee breaks, networking or social socializing events, even though also these form have network uh, or as networks share similarities. What all these organizational forms that I just mentioned have in common is that they are made of people, sometimes representing institutions, or initiatives sometimes just representing themselves. And perhaps this makes it clear why we also talk about sociology today. To say it with Bourdieu, network's most valuable resource is their social capital. The people are the carrier of knowledge, the sharer of information, the actors, and the primary beneficiaries. I think this is key to understand when it comes to benefits and challenges of networks. Thinking networks from the individuum Make already give, may already give many hints and answers. Further character, characteristic compared to other organizational forms, such as institutions or enterprises, are that networks are supposed or are often, this is just, of course, uh, it's not a, it's, it's a, how you say, a, an average of experience, so that networks are more flexible because they have heavy, they have no heavy or fixed structures for the same reasons they can adapt quicker to new situations and therefore are often more dynamic. Another reason for that is that they are often very diverse, diverse in people, in institutions, in perspectives, and that they have a more fluid membership than other formats. These features often turn networks into, into an incubator for change. Also, the fact that they have no or little hierarchy hierarchy is supporting the before the, the characteristics, characteristics that I just mentioned. And when it comes to international networks, meaning networks of international collaboration, I would also add these five characteristics. These international networks feature as an add-on more language diversity. They might there might be also geodynamics when it goes beyond continents, for example. They have geographically more dispersed members, they are culturally more diverse, and often they have, yeah, scarce or more scarce or more or scarce resources than nationally working networks. And therefore, this leads me to my, um, and to sum up this first part, and this leads me to my to my assumptions, uh, the basis for what I will say um, afterwards, um, when it comes to networks. So first, I think that networks, life, blood, so the currency I referred to before, is made of knowledge and communication. And the network's most important resource is their social capital, so the people, the members. Because these people, the members, 
are key to transfer, exchange, to generate knowledge and to communicate information. But before I continue, um, now I would look like I would like to know a bit more about you, because I don't see you, I don't hear you, um, and therefore we prepared a short survey so that you and me can get a better idea of who is here today and also what kind of experience you bring to this webinar. And of course, it's also because it's a little bit more fun. So the you see already the four questions. So I give you some some time to 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 answer these questions. It's about what do you think, whether you think networking is an art, why are you here today, and how many networks you think you are part of, and also what you think is most valuable when it comes to networks. And of course, you only have one option to answer when, when there are multiple choices. Uh, actually, it's not a multiple choice, so just choose that one that is most relevant, most true for you. and last minute is running. Okay, thank you for your answers and let's see what is the result. Okay, let's see how it looks like. Perhaps you can scroll a bit down, Nemo team. So 70% of you answered the questions. And 75%, I think, 85, 48% think that you, it, networking is an art, which is interesting. I, I will also share my insights afterwards. And most of you are here because you want to improve your networking skills. Okay, I hope I will, I will uh, help, I will be helpful for that. And also because you want to learn, this is always nice. And then the question, how many networks do you think you are part of? It's less than five. Okay, the question then also would be, what kind of, uh, did you apply the network definition that I just mentioned? And this is already a lot. And the last question, 
why you value networks that most of you think it's because of exchanging experience. And rather than receiving edited information, this could also be a hint uh, for all those coordinating networks. And yeah, so this is nice because it uh, also hints me towards my next part. Thank you for, for taking part in the survey it, uh, and thank you for sharing the results. Um, and I, as I said, I would also like to share my insight. So um, I think, uh, at least for the first question, I, I also think that uh, networking is an art, an often underestimated one. I think the artistic aspect lies in dealing, handling, coping with the diversity inherent to, inherent to networks. While I think diversity makes networks richer, and not only networks, of course, um, because you have, a, you have a diversity of individuals and of or organizations, and therefore you have a diversity of approaches and perspectives of cultures, of course, but at the same time, you also, I think diversity can also be a challenge because you have a diversity of interests that might be hidden agendas or even diverging interests. Um, you have a diversity of personalities and in the sense, in, in a rather negative sense, in the sense of egos, for example. And of course, you have also a diversity of closed systems, especially when it's a network of organization. So systems that they are, that are self-enclosed and that may speak different languages. So it's always hard also, or it can be hard to bring these different systems into, into dialogue. Coming to my second part, and probably this is uh, most interesting for you. Um, let's look at networks in the museum sector. And let's see how the phenomenon of networking looks like in the museum sector. Is there something specific or different when it comes to museum networks. From an external point of view, as I said, I'm not a museum expert. I think that the museum sector is a very traditional and well-organized one. I think the best example for it is ICOM, founded in 1946 already. Also semantic-wise, it is interesting to see that we call networks today, uh, or what we call networks today, were then were at the time founded at committees or councils like 70 years ago, for example. And another specific aspect, in my opinion, is that, uh, that museum networks are, in most cases, networks of institutions with fixed structures, so with buildings, for example, following all similar goals, of course, while taking very different steps to do so. And my hypoth hypothesis is that they might be more homogeneous than other networks. Further, I think museums, and it has to be taken into account when talking about museum networks, is that museum itself have a strong network function within their own community. So they bring people together, they share experience, they share information, they share knowledge. And, uh, but coming back to some examples, and the following examples should underline what I just say, said, also making what I just said a little bit more tangible, a little bit more uh, visible, and it should also pave the way to what will follow afterwards. So as I already mentioned, the most famous example of, uh, of networks in the museum sector is, uh, is ICOM, so the International Council of Museums. And I found it very nice when I prepared my presentation for today to see their current slogan on their website. So museums have no borders, they have a network. So ICOM is a network of ne networks made up of national museum networks and of course also of professionals and i think that this example shows very well the long history of networks in the museum sector and the longing for of joining forces for a common cause to be heard as a museum at the same time the history of icom if you look if you look at the history of icom and how it was uh, founded and how it developed over the years also shows how hard it is to maintain and sustain international networks over the years and that constant reinvention is key to survive. It also shows how vulnerable they are. Networks are often add-ons, nice to have, and strongly depend on personal engagement. ICOM also nicely illustrates the intangible resource of networks. So knowledge, information, and how this can translate over time also into global activities 
And here I would like to, 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 to mention the International Museum Day, which I found a very, a very striking example. And uh, further, if you look at further activities of ICOM, you see also the function of a typical function of networks, for example, as standard setting. For example, the, the recent adopted definition or new definition of museums, or also the, the typical activity of raising awareness for the common cause, for example, the red lists. And also the agenda setting role um, that networks uh, may, may take, for example, to highlight the social role of museums in case of ICOM, and of course, the exchange uh, uh, activities uh, to organize meeting and to, to share or to, to compile publications. And here I'm already talking about impact, but I will uh, add, on, uh, add on that later on. At regional level, there are also several continental or even bicontinental networks. And besides NEMO, which you know all well and of are probably all a uh, member of it, um, there's ASIMUS, the Asia Europe Museum Network. This, ex this example is rather, I mean, compared to ICOM, for example, it's rather a new one. It was found in 2000. And uh, again, here you can see a connection with ICOM because also ICOM went or went to Asia in the, um, or, yeah, uh, la enlarged the, the membership to Asia in the early, uh, how you call it, at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, it might also be the other way around, and but both both ways show the impact of networking. So Azimuth is a specialized network, and uh, their specialty is the Asian collections uh, in European and Asian museums. And Azimuth supports uh, knowledge and staff exchange between Asia and Europe, and it also supports the development of collaborative projects among member museums. However, I think also this example shows the challenges of international networks and how difficult it can be to sustain networks over so many years. The website, for example, of Azimos is shut down and the Secretariat is secured until 2020. So what's ahead? Another example of interregional collaboration and of extensive knowledge and experience exchange is IBE Museos, which exists since 2007. And the name suggests already it's an Ibero-American network, uh, sharing knowledge and best practice. It also acts as an observatory, so as a guard watch, for example, on, on, on what's going on uh, with museums in, in, in Ibero-American. And it offer, also offers many trainings to their members. And you might have uh, recently joined one of their webinars also. Uh, they have a current theory about museums in the pandemic crisis. And further to these activities, Iber Museos also aims at the formulation of public uh, museum policies. So this is another, uh, as we saw with ICOM, it also goes into the direction of standard setting. And what is specific about Iber Museos is that this is rather a program, an intergo intergovernmental one. Um, however, it gathers and coordinates over 9,000 museums and it's facing similar, um, yeah, let's say, challenges. Like, for example, linguistic diversity, working in two or three languages uh, to somehow coordinate diverse institutions with different political, economical, or even social and cultural contexts. And coming to the national level, um, the example par excellence of joining forces for a common cause are the nationwide associations of museums. And, and I do not want to give a specific example and pick out one but I name what most of them have in common. They represent the interests of museums in policymaking process within their country. Um, they offer benefits uh, for their members, such, such as uh, special entry fees, for example. They provide substantial information platforms on their websites or organize trainings and meetings for their members or also like uh, technical assistance, for example. And they also represent their country in, in regional or even international networks. And they are all made up, obviously, of museum organizations and some also accept individuals or museum professionals to their members, to their membership. We could also go now to the local level, um, where you often find very vivid networks of small local museums, which are perhaps 
less uh, or not that well uh, equipped with, with finances or infrastructure. And these museums also do team up um, at a very local level to share their resources and work in synergy. But I won't do that for now for time reasons and I leave this up to you to discover. So I would like to highlight the impact of museum networks using again the example of ICOM because I think ICOM somehow gathers uh, all other networks as it is a network of networks and would not exist without its national and regional branches without neglecting also all other non-institutional uh, individual professional networks in the museum field. I think the most striking impacts are that ICOM enables museum sectors to speak with one voice. And I can imagine that not all museums all over the world would, sub would subscribe to this. However, it is considered to be the global voice or let's say the most global voice of museums. Uh, also, for, exa for example, it, uh, by UNESCO, it is um, when it talks to UNESCO. Further examples of the impact of ICOM's work is that the code of ethics in museums, for example, is now a global standard. And what I already mentioned, the International Museum Day, which started as an idea, uh, is now is now results in, in worldwide activities. So it really gets tangible. And uh, the 2000 established red lists helps nowadays different national and international agencies to enforce the law. So this tool has contributed to the identification, recovery and restitution of thousands of cultural objects, e.g. in Iraq, Afghanistan or Mali. And networks do also have an impact at personal level, which I would sum up as personal growth. Through the work in and via networks, people develop personally and professionally by exchanging experience, receiving targeted trainings, and yes, also by traveling, even though this is not an option today or nowadays or right now. This often results in, in broadened horizon, professional horizons, in new and more opportunities because the access to, to information is wider, is bigger, so the network is larger. And also people have access to a, to a community of practice, to a community of peers, which they can consult uh, on a regular basis. And I think this helps also strengthen the identity as a professional, for example. In brief, often people find a professional family in networks. And it is most interesting, in case you are co a coordinator of network, or even if you're only a member of network, to listen to your members or to your co-members uh, co uh, for their personal network uh, journeys, um, you will receive many, many unexpected insights. And I think as a coordinator, or even, even if not, it, may be, it can be very rewarding. And I think the benefits of networking become specifically visible in times of crisis, at the one we are currently experiencing, and I would briefly like to share my personal experience with a nowadays rather informal network, the one that I founded like over 10 years ago. So even though this network is not as active as it has been before, we are still in touch and do collaborate uh, on, on different occasions and in an ir irregular basis. So when the pandemic went global, um, this was like a wake up call and we started checking on each other. And the, at the end, of this resulted in weekly video calls where we first ta talked about the specific COVID-19 situation in our countries and about our, our personal situation, about our prof professional situations. And then we started designing a joint project, which is still in line with our, our common cause that we all share, that, that brings us together. And uh, just uh, a week ago, we just submitted uh, a project proposal for funding to UNESCO and crossing fingers that it went, uh, that it went through. So the, this shows to me this very small example, uh, how we rely on such communities you have once shared strong values or experiences with. This crisis for us was a boost for action and reconnection. And you might have your personal story. And um, I also have seen many European networks that reacted and adapted super quickly to the new situation, took care of its members and launched campaigns to raise voice 
voices and design activities to support each other in this difficult situation or in this new situation where known paradigms are shifted towards the unknown and the uncertain. However, th there is no light without shadow. So every benefit comes also with a challenge. And I think the, the, the most common one are, um, or what I also observe, that networks often struggle when there is a lack of commitment among the members and or a lack of leadership. So the, so the challenge here is to keep the dynamic high, even though often the networking work is not part of your, of your daily job portfolio or of your daily work of the members, but often an add-on. So this makes this particularly um, difficult for coordinators or, or even for yourself if you're part of a network to, to engage on a regular basis into the network. Further networks, and those mentioned before, do have small coordinating office. In, in, ideal, in ideal cases, it, it's one or two person working, working for the network on a daily basis. In my opinion, this is due, these little offices is due to the logic of our funding systems. I mean that our funding schemes request tangible results. But networks often do have no tangible results at first hand. But because as I shared, they first translate into exchange and collaboration, for example. Later on, these experiences often result in tangible results, but this is hard to explain to funders, to make a very complex uh, story short. And with limited resources often comes the challenge of continuity. The real work starts when the first passion is over or people return home, for example, after a meeting. So this leads me to my question and this leads me to my uh, uh, last part. So how to make networks efficient, resilient and sustainable? And in a nutshell, this is my answer. Start with the magic moment. So sharing a special moment, a special achievement, be it personally or professionally, strengthens the cohesion of the network, also beyond geographical distances. A moment that connects people beyond that moment, beyond uh, also institutional borders, for example. This also means that face-to-face -face, face -face meetings are key. Invest in trust. Among network members, among members and the coordinating instance through hard work, commitment, transparency and coherence. And a network will work sustainably and is resilient in the sense that it is not overwhelmed by a first wave of unforeseen happenings um, when the taking and receiving, uh, receiving is, in a ba is balanced. So which means that members give as much as they receive to and from the network permanently I think a network will only thrive if it is not a one-way road. And be relevant also to the cause that connects you and holds the network together. Be relevant to the community, to your target group, let's say, that helps to survive because you are needed. And you will be missed if you, don't, if you do not exist anymore, for example. And to reach relevance, of course, means also to be innovative and diverse, to listen to the inside of the network, but also to the outside world. It implies many further things and can also mean that once you have reached the common goal, that networks dissolve and people move on. And I think also that's okay. And of course, at the end of the day, you need time that people dedicate to it, financial resources, um, etc. But however, I like to believe that these four aspects um, will result in, in, a, in a positive and in, in efficient, resilient and sustainable networks if they are in, in, in balance and equilibrium. And how to get there? This is probably your biggest question, I would, if I would be you. <laughs> so I'd like to give you some hints to check whether you're on the right track or where you, where you could adjust your network or even your membership. And I suggest these uh, six parameters. So the vision or the goal, communication, resources, social capital, performance, and coordination. And it is a perspective that you can choose when looking at your network. And it can also serve as an evaluation grid, for example. So the first one uh, is vision, which can also be called goals or the change you want to reach with the, with the work you do. It, I think it 
it is helpful to check with your members or with your coordinating instance why you are together. And if there is more than one answer, then I think it's helpful to clarify the vision and ask what is the common goal, the cause you all follow? How do you reach this goal? And perhaps also translate this answer into a mission statement. Also, is there a time limit to your cause? Of what I just mentioned, for example, perhaps it might be a, a time limited goal you have, for example, to reach uh, a, a law uh, by the end of the year. So then it's okay to, to, to have an exit strategy as a network too. And I think also that, uh, that, that strong networks have a clear answer to the last question. What differentiates you from others? So the second parameter is social capital, and you might recall the image I showed at the beginning with the many little persons. As social capital is a currency, you might want to check how it looks like in your network, how to be a member or how to become a member, and perhaps also how to, access the, how to exit the network as a member. And uh, also to see what do members get, and what do members give also, or what they need to give so that that the network can, can, can work and can survive. And also, why do members are members? So what is their particular interest in being a member? And, I, and this also implies seeing the individual, which can result in more human-centered approaches, which, can, which again can result in, in a smoother run of projects because the human factor is taken into account. The third parameter is communication, and I differentiate, differentiate here in uh, from internal to and external communication. Um, and I think it is essential to have a common understanding of how you want to communicate within the networks and how often, but also how do you want to be seen from outside? And then ask, okay, what do you need for that? What, what kind of channels, tools, what kind of information, what kind of knowledge and expertise? And I think a transparent and a regular communication lastly also helps to create trust among each other. The fourth parameter is performance, and um, which can also call be activities. So what I mean is actually activities, but the how do you implement these? How do you perform to implement these activities? Um, and to see, to check whether these are in accordance with your vision, with your resources, with your values, is there coherence within all that? Are these activities relevant to your to your target group, to community, to your members, for example? And what, uh, what can you do better together and perhaps also to see what, what is better if the, the members do it on their own? And are these activities representing your superpower and also your unique selling point as a network, for example? And the performance, I think, impacts very strongly the visibility, of course, how you, how you are seen as a network from outside, and it contributes to your accountability as a network and it also creates trust, again, uh, outside your network, in your network, for example, as a reliable partner. And the fifth parameter is resources. And I think it is very good to, or it is, it is essential, actually, to be aware of your resources. And when I say resources here, I mean financial resources, of course, but also your, your personal uh, staff capacities. So how many people are actually dedicating time to it? Also, your, your creative resources in the sense of expertise, skills you need, for example, to communicate or to implement a specific activity. And then also to see, so what do you have? But of course, then also, what do you need? For example, if you want to reach out to, to a new target group or you want to test a new activity and to see how you could get these resources, be it, for example, via your members so that you perhaps also change your membership criteria, that you request specific funding, or also that you offer training, for example, to the, to the coordination or to the members or both. So there are many ways to ex also to enlarge the resources. And the last parameter is uh, coordination. And, this, uh, and you can also ask, how do you want to organize? And I'm also sharing here two uh, very simple models. Of course, there, is, there are uh, more answers to that question. But for example, it could be a coordinating office, which is very common, I think, in the museum sector, uh, which is centralized governance. So there is one office or one person 
who is uh, pushing the communication, who is sharing the information, who is organizing the meetings, the events. Um, so you can say it, it's, it's a centralized governance um, or it's a members governed network so with a decentralized governance so that, for, for example, there is one person in charge for the website, there's another person in charge for the funding, etc., etc. It can, of course, also mix or even uh, anything else. But I think it, it, it's good to have a clear idea and to have a clarity about this issue. Also, also to see how does decision making processes look like. Uh, is um, who is in charge and for how long, and to see uh, whether the network is democratic, participatory enough to allow members to 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 be committed to the network, to have their share in the network. And visually, I condense the complexity of this question of coordinating and governing networks into this colorful ball. And the message here is not uh, that you uh, now need to read the full ball, um, but it's rather um, an invitation to, to look a little bit deeper, to dig deeper into the issue of network governance. And the message here is that each parameter, and of course there are more parameters than those I just uh, presented, that they are linked to each other and they affect each other. And I share here also the link on my research on network governance, which you can access by the following link. And now before closing, we have time, like 15 minutes, a little bit more to interact. And I, and I invite you, if not yet done, to write questions or comments you might have into the public chat. And uh, the Nemo team will cluster these questions for me and I will tr I try to answer or comment as much as possible. So please go. Okay, I have a first question from Yvonne. So she would like to know uh, whether I would say that the decentralized governance has specific challenges or benefits. And of course, I think, yes, uh, all of these models have their specific challenges and benefits. And it depends very much on, on the network itself, on the, on the circumstances you are working in. I think the decentral, the, one of the benefits of decentralized governance is that you have I think that you have a stronger commitment among your members because they, they have they are actively participating and, and shaping the network. Um, but at the same time, this might also be a, 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 a challenge because um, this would rather be like, uh, I think often I see that it is, uh, they work on a voluntary basis. So as soon, as there is a, another project uh, or, or that 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 was a heavy deadline that this voluntary work will put aside so i think the the decentralized governance is is rather vulnerable to to continuity or to 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 sustain uh, to sustain continuity And the next question is whether I have examples of how networks from different sectors can interact with each other, for example, health, civic, so civil society. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question. I, I'm always looking for these examples. I'm sure that they are. So uh, spontaneously, I would um, let me think. Perhaps at the end, I will have an answer. But I think this, this is most interesting to combine networks from different sectors because um, the interest or even it's different from institutions because networks are more networks are more flexible they do not have a heavy agenda um, and they can collaborate perhaps a little bit uh, in, a, in a more easy in a more smooth way than others um, let me think about that question or even we can because i don't have a specific example right now and another question from Anastasia is, um, is 
examples for successful decentralized governance model. Again, the examples is always <laughs> interesting. Um, also here, I would have to, to think. I think the example I just showed from my personal experience now, because this network um, was had a centralized governance um and we now now that there are no that there is no further support let's say institutional support for the for a centralized governance we are now moving slowly uh, into a decentralized governance even we wouldn't call it governance but into a self-organized way and this is uh, as i said already before it's um and it's uh, what the network i'm talking about is the u40 network for cultural diversity and uh, so that we now have in a de decentralized way of course we had roles and people who took over specific responsibilities and we 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 managed to write we even with over five or six yeah five continents we wrote this project proposal and i think this was a very positive experience after having experienced a, con uh, a centralized governance to have now a decentralized approach and see that it works and I also, we can also be in contact afterwards whether I, when I have more time to think about examples. So the question from Estelle, whether I think a good network should use project management softwares. I think what is really essential for a good network or a good working network is to have a good communication platform, a good communication channel. So if it's also, if it includes a project management software, that's good. But what I think is more important than having a project management software is to have a communication software or even a platform or whatever, where people can exchange quickly, where they can look up information without calling uh, the coordination office again and again um, to have yeah structured information, structured uh, um, uh, yeah, a, a knowledge, uh, a database, for example. And um, of course, if you then go to concrete project uh, implementation, then of course it might help to also have a project management software, especially if you're working uh, with, with, with people from all over the world or even from different countries. And it, of course it helps, but I think it's not as, as essential as to have a communication platform. And another question from John, that I say that currency of networks are communication and knowledge, but what about change? You mean why you think currency is the, uh, the currency of networks is also change? Yeah, I think the, or perhaps it's better to have the, the example of the lifeblood. So to see what, when I showed the example, the very first image of, of the networks where you have the, the, the points and the lines and to see what happens in between the point and the line there, I think what is, what is transferred on the lines and in between the points is that that this is often communicate or this is often communication and knowledge and and the change is what happens through that what is transferred so of course uh, uh, this communication and knowledge contributes to have to transform to have a change in what what uh, way in one way or the other and i think it's uh, first it is uh, in communication and knowledge and then this transfers into change and another question from Rossini, if I would say that networks more than ever have become more important, more needed in the pandemic time. Yes, I think I think that, that is uh, why I shared also the example and also that I said, I mean, you can observe it in the European network sector um, that that even that even they become even more active than ever. I mean, they they engaged into advocacy activities towards the parla parliaments, for example, towards the towards the political decision makers. They are shared experience on how particular members are dealing with the with a with a specific situation. So to to not leave people alone and in such a new situation, I think this is a very this is a key also in this situation. And I think networks are very suitable to do so because they ha they are like over they are on a on a different level. They are overlooking and connecting people from very different. Um, uh, context and uh, to combine these contexts, there there might be new answers. And I think uh, that networks. Uh, 
yeah, play or are playing a crucial role in dealing with the new challenges that we are facing right now. And another question from Amilcar. Um, what bibliography you would recommend to start trans networks for museums, heritage sites? Okay, yeah, this is a good question. I think I would start uh, looking at the websites from ICOM, from NEMO, also from Iber Museos. I think they are very, these are the examples I, 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 I shared, or even NEMO, we are, thanks to NEMO, we are here. So I think there um, might be, there, there's substantial information and knowledge there and even if you don't have the this the the title of the publication might not hint to your answer then i think it is helpful to to read in between the lines um and of course also at the end you will see uh, i also shared uh, my website and so you have also publications about uh networks more specific but not specific in the museum field. So I think I, it, it would be a combination of both to look at the specialized websites and then look at the site of networks and then um, draw your own conclusion from that. And the last question, I think, oh no, not the last, um, from E, E, oh, I don't know how to spell his name, Irakse. Um, regarding challenges of integrating and coordination older and younger members in a network, can you give us more examples of successful networks, even if they are not in the museum sector? I think this question I, it was never a striking one to me. I mean, I would say this is the diversity I pointed out why I think networking is an art to have the diversity also of age in a in a in a network, and I think it it, it the the art uh, of um, of dealing with, with with these kind of diverse membership is in in strengthen and make visible the strengths of each of the groups you might have within 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 the network for example to see what are the young members good in and what they can share what they can offer and then what can the older ones offer and and share with the younger ones to to do not make it a, uh, to not take it as a division within the network um but but as a as a yeah, it's a strong point that you have such a diversity in your network, because I think it makes uh, it, it it makes them stronger. And I think that uh, I would say that networks like traditional ones, they do often have rather older is also a very <laughs> strong word, but but rather let's say like the senior professionals uh, in there. And I think it's particularly interesting. Um, to for networks also if they want to survive to invest in a younger membership and um i think a, a very nice one or I, where i like how they handle uh, the membership and how they are speaking to their members is trans europe halls i think they are doing quite a quite a good job also because they yeah they are they are integrating also their new members in a very active way so you might uh, want to have a look at that one And the question from Rima, what is most important, networking with teams or team building itself? So I think um, a team needs team building. <laughs> so you, I think if you want to uh, network with teams, then you first need to build a team. So I think it's not a question of uh, of what is more important, but of doing both at the same time or even one after the other. I'm not sure whether I get this question. So if not, please uh, write again in the chat. So from Tamara, what in your experience is a key motivation for the network members to participate more actively in networking? Yeah, so the key uh, motivation is, I think, when they can, when they are seen by the coordination office with their, uh, let's say, with their superpower or with their qualifications, and when they can con contribute, so that they can see that when they contribute something, that it will also be taken up and that they will be um, yeah, integrated in the, into the work of network. And I think uh, another motivation, of course, is also to, to have, for the members, to have a resource to have a resource of peers, peers of people, of, of, exper uh, of expertise that you can quickly access. 
But I think here also lies a, a challenge because people often only have this first mo the, the, the motivation of receiving these or having this access, but they do not see that for having it and for, for maintaining it, that they have to also to invest. Because if imagine if you only um, have the motivation of receiving and having this uh, community of peers uh, and nobody would give, then this community wouldn't be a community of peers. So I think it, uh, it, is, it is important, first of all, to understand that there are different motivations for members to be part of. Of course, like, like let's call it the the self, um, yeah, the self referential one. But then often also uh, people who want to contribute, who want to uh, um, contribute to change or to to shape, let's put it in a very big picture, to shape their future or the future of of the sector they are working in. So the question I just yeah, this I can still take it. From Victoria, how do you give continuity to the network without losing the interest, of, interest of the members, and how do you handle the differences of these members to achieve common goals? So the, I will start with the last question: How to achieve a common goal? I think the common goal should be the reason why are you together. So you shouldn't be together if you don't have a common goal. So um, and if it's uh, only just to to be heard and to to be heard as a as a sector, for example. Um, so the last question is, then of course there might be, the, the, the importance is that there is one common goal. And of course, there might be different other goals that members are pursuing because when they are participating in the network. And this is also okay. And because it's also because of the diversity, people can take out different things from a network and contribute different things to the networks. Um, but, the, but the most important is that, the, that somehow it, um, goes into the same direction and how to give continuity to the network without losing the interest of, of the members is I think you to always provide interesting I mean through relevance what I said to provide relevant information to provide to provide relevant offer offers for example like trainings that are uh, that are needed by the members so that you don't um, so that you carefully listen to what is needed and also what is en vogue, for example, now if you provide now in the, in the pandemic crisis, uh, uh, I don't know, a seminar on or even a publication on how to on how to travel, for example, this wouldn't be like, uh, this would be completely out of sight. So I think the, the relevance um, is, a, is an important key. And also I think to, to, regular, um, to regular dialogue, to, this is uh, regularity, and relevance. And I think this will be the last question before I close from Anais. What specific project management tools or communication tools would you recommend? Yeah, this is also a good question. I have, it, it depends also if you're a, a, a one language the network or a bilingual or even a multilingual network, because there are many tools like uh, like Slack or even uh, even the project management tool like Trello that, that do work very well also for networks um, uh, in if you are if you are talking the same language but once you are having more than one language then then these tools have a very limited access and I meaning uh, I, because this led in my own experience in, and I had twice of these experiences led me to setting up my own communication tool um, because uh, yeah the perhaps it, it there perhaps you know already in the community here you know uh, already tools that are uh, able to to multilingual exchange um, but they are to set up to 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 program my own um, intranet, for example, on the website, uh, where to have a, a members forum, a members list, etc. Um, and of course, what 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 was the 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 most simple things I think work better. For example, like a face group, uh, Facebook group works very very good because people are are there already. So also see where the people are already when you set up your your channels or tools, and not to and to avoid, if possible, just to have another another whatsoever um, 
communication tool. Even I said I set up my own tools, but because it was really there was no other options, or to to have it as an add-on to to also have a mix of tools. Um, that uh, and I think there there is a good solution, and also because people are communicating differently, they are not everybody is on Facebook, for example, or. Um, and what also worked quite well is the typical traditional mailing list, because also people are still very much into their mailing, uh, into their into, into their mails, um, and it goes it comes to them directly, and they don't have to go somewhere on a platform to get the information. I think this is what I meant when when I said you have to see that networks are made of people, and um, so what is human? What is a human? A behavior what how does the human being actually uh, functions and it, it's um, and I think the most easiest way is the most successful so and I think I uh, thank you for these challenging questions so please for those I didn't um, had an answer to please get in touch and I share my contact details um, so yeah if you should have further specific question comments or even feedback so please get in touch also check my website uh, for further information about my work also for for further publication and further reading and i thank you for participating uh, both in the survey both listening to me and also providing these uh, very substantial questions and it was my pleasure um, to be here with you and i thank nemo also to the team uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to share my experience and um, yeah take care stay healthy and happy networking thank you and goodbye